Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Richard McCullough from uh, Harvard University, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Emily Carter from Princeton University, who gave us a talk on quantum mechanical simulations of millions of atoms and its application to fusion energy. Good morning. So I think I'm the interlude between different pharmaceutical talks, so that's interesting. So um, at least the physical scientists in the room hopefully will appreciate this, but I hope that, that the rest of you also will. I thought it was interesting that the talk that we just heard, which was really fascinating, um, focused on or made the suggestion, and I fully uh, can appreciate this, that the 21st century will be the century of biology, and it's a very common thing to say, and I think it, it, there's, war, you know, there's, there's reasons to believe that that's so. I would say, in addition, it better be the century for clean and sustainable energy and, um, and a clean and sustainable environment. And that's what I work on. Um, I'm going to just give you, because it's a 15-minute talk, uh, a very brief interlude into not the patents and licensing and things like that that I've been involved in, but I thought it would be interesting to give you a little bit of a sense of how um, the work that leads to the inventions and the patents actually comes about in my laboratory, and that is I'm a computational scientist, and what I do is I develop, I invent software um, that in fact then can be used to enable uh, the discoveries that are done in partnership. Um, in this particular case, I'm, uh, it's done in partnership with the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which is the leading national institution for magnetic confinement fusion. So I'm going to very, just give you a little sense of, of the kind of work that we do. Um, so what you see here um, is essentially an outline of it. It's a different title, but it, the title is related to what I'm going to talk about, the title that's in the program. Um, we start with the theory of quantum mechanics. Uh, I wish that was me, it's not me, but anyway. Um, uh, you start with the theory of quantum mechanics, and that is all based on uh, a central equation that many of you may have seen at some point in your life, and that is the Schrodinger equation. It's, uh, it's, uh, you, you will see some equations in this talk, not many, but it is the central equation that if you solve it, you know where the quantum particles are. Why do we need quantum mechanics? Because in materials, which is what I'm interested in, um, materials for energy, uh, what determines the behavior of materials is in fact the distribution, both in terms of space and energy, of the electrons that are in those materials, the electrons that are in the atoms. And so, um, so this equation, in fact, gives you both of those pieces of information, the distribution of energies of those electrons and the distribution of where, they are, where the electrons are in space. And, uh, and the problem is that that equation can only be solved for very simple problems. And in fact, in the case of matter, uh, in the case of electrons, it can only be solved exactly for one electron. So that's very sad because anything you're, you know, most things you're interested in have many more than one electron. And so, in fact, it has uh, an n factorial complexity where n is the number of electrons. So that's a real problem. And in fact, what one does instead, and what I've spent my life doing, is developing approximations to that equation that don't do violence to the physics of, of, what, of the interaction, but allow you to actually have a tractable solution mathematically. And then you write computer code that enables the solution of those mathematical equations. You put it on a supercomputer, and voila, out comes something that tells you about both a, um, a spatial distribution. This is actually in, um, in a transition metal oxide. I'm not going to talk about it. But it has to do with solar energy conversion, and then also an energy distribution of where the electrons are in space, that, how they change actually in space, and how they move through the material, which is important for solar energy conversion. Um, so that, that sort of gives you a little bit of a, of a background of, of the approach that we take. And then what I'm going to talk about, though, in fact, to solve this, even, even with approximations, to solve this equation, uh, at a degree of accuracy that's required for the, the kinds of, of uh, computations I'm showing on this slide. In fact, we can treat only up to uh, maybe a couple of hundred atoms accurately enough 
um, with this technique. And for many problems, that's not enough. I mean, there are, there are very interesting situations where you might want to look at dilution that involves many, many, many more atoms. And so we have to even do a greater simplification. Instead of solving directly for this psi here, this is the wave function, which is what leads to this enormous complexity, the wave function is really essentially only telling you, it's not something that you can actually uh, probe directly experimentally. What you can probe is the probability of finding the electrons in space or the electron density. And so, in fact, that leads to a different theory that's called density functional theory. Um, the Nobel Prize was given for this in chemistry a number of years ago. Um, and this is a different equation. And the equation here solves directly for the electron density rho. I won't go through the details of it, but what we are, in our hands, what we have been able to do is to take this theory and develop accurate approximations for each part, each part of the terms that allow us now on supercomputers to, in fact, solve for millions of atoms. Not hundreds, but millions of atoms. So it's, it's an important um, uh, step forward. And that is, I would consider, an invention that is worth talking about at the National Academy of, uh, of Inventors Techno um, uh, Conference. The application I want to talk to you about has to do with fusion energy. This is actually from the, ex um, oops, from the experiment uh, that, is, that is being done at the, at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. It is um, an experiment designed to figure out how, just to give you a sense of the a magnitude of the problem, what we're trying to do is have a clean source of electricity that you could have continuously, which isn't offered by solar, which isn't offered by wind, but fusion with, with resources that come just from seawater and from lithium in the Earth's mantle, one can envision a future where you have essentially a unlimited, nearly unlimited supply of continuous electricity without the problems associated with nuclear energy in terms of, of the safety and radioactivity issues. The big problem with fusion is that you're trying to contain essentially the, the magnitude of a sun in a much smaller space than the sun. And that is, can be done using magnetic fields, magnetic confinement fusion, but the magnetic, magnetic bottle actually leaks. And when it leaks, it leaks out um, things like deuterium atoms, which is an isotope of hydrogen, um, or, or tritium atoms, also neutrons. And the problem is, how do you contain then, how, how do you imagine building a, a reactor out of some material that can withstand uh, those particles coming out at fairly high energy? It's a serious problem. In particular, the neutrons do damage to any solid, okay? And so what, what happens is that the solid in fact, we'll have a, we'll, here's a picture of a solid. A solid has an ordered array of atoms, and the neutrons come in, and they knock atoms out of place, and they create what are called vacancies. They basically create an atomic-level sponge for the deuterium and the tritium that is also coming in. Why is that a problem? Because the walls made out of a metal, essentially when you, when you bring hydrogen in, uh, or deuterium or tritium, it embrittles the metal. And so you'll end up essentially having a wall that can't, that can't last. And if you want to imagine having a, a reactor that's going to last of the order of, you know, a power station on, of the order of 40 years, there's no way that these materials will survive. So an interesting idea, uh, not mine, but it was a very interesting idea from a couple of decades ago, was instead of using a solid wall, to have the first wall that the, 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 that the, the leaking particles see be a liquid. Very strange, right? But the idea is to have a flowing liquid on a, on a wall that is adhered to the wall. And the idea in particular is to use lithium as that liquid uh, and see whether or not that having a liquid can uh, get around these problems. What's the problem? The pro so as I said, the problem is the embrittlement. And the beauty of using a liquid, right, is that a liquid, all the atoms are out of place already. So if you have neutrons coming in, they don't do any damage to, to a liquid because there is no damage to do. And the second reason, the second really interesting idea here in terms of using liquid lithium in particular is that lithium plus neutrons breeds actually tritium, which is one of the fuels of the reactor. So you don't do any damage to the plasma. 
it, that, is, that is making the fusion. So it's a beautiful idea, but technologically very challenging. And so there's an experiment going on at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab about this. Um, and we, but it's extremely difficult, as you can imagine, to go in and interrogate it while you're doing the experiments. And so that's where the computational science comes in, because we can do simulations, computer simulations, of deuterium bombarding lithium, liquid lithium, and understanding the properties of liquid lithium in order to see whether or not this is going to work. So that's what we're about. Um, and I think because I've spent so much time doing the introduction, I'm going to I'm going to speed through this. I bet I don't have very much time. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. So here's a slide that has some math on it. The bottom line is to explain to you that in the end of the day, traditional methods for solving the equation that I showed you before use what's called the fast Fourier transform, and so that's this expression uh, right here. Uh, and, and it allows our methods to scale um, so-called linearly, very fast algorithms. But the problem is on normal supercomputers, you can only, this, this algorithm only works up to about a, about a thousand processors, a thousand cores on, the, on these modern supercomputers. And together with Lin Wan Wang at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, and uh, a postdoc of mine, what we have been able to do is to in insert into our, uh, our code a new method that essentially divides up space and, and does what's called a small box for fast Fourier transform all over space and allows us to get to, and here is an example of the of, you know, software invention. Um, it, this is showing the amount of time it takes to treat, in this case, a million atoms, but we've done recently up to 10 million atoms as a function of the number of processors. This was our old code, actually just published this year, that could use about 1,000 processors before it starts to break. And now with this new in invention of an algorithm, we are able to reduce the time dramatically and be able to take, to use of the, you know, of the order of 100,000 processors and take advantage of um, what's called petascale computing. So that's actually quite exciting. Um, so uh, just to show you the kind of information you can get out from this, looking at bulk liquid lithium, this is a picture showing you, as a function of temperature, um, what happens to a solid as you heat it. And uh, you may remember that, that if you um, heat, a, heat a solid, mo most uh, um, solids, when you heat them, they will expand. And eventually, they will, of course, melt. And what you look for, for looking for a phase transition from a solid to a liquid, you look for a discontinuous change in the density. And that's what you're seeing right here. And in fact, um, our, our computations are able to predict a melting point, which agrees with experiment extremely well. And so that tells you that you know, the method that, that we have developed, in fact, should be trusted at least to study liquid lithium. And so um, this is other data that is matching experiment well in terms of the structure of liquid lithium. Then, of course, what we're talking about, what we're interested in, is a film, a flowing film of liquid lithium. So we need to understand, can we describe a liquid vapor interface? And this is a simulation that we've done, a um, set of simulations we've done. And this, uh, we can calculate the surface tension. And we see, again, very nice agreement with experiment. And so these are all sort of validation um, uh, experiments. Here's some uh, um, experiments that have been done that uh, essentially shows something really interesting. And I think, in, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to the next slide, because it's really covered here even in more detail. So this is a, this is a, a cartoon that has way too much information on it. It's just to show you that there's chaos going on in the, in the fusion reactor involving lots of different particles bombarding this liquid lithium. And what's interesting is that experiments that had been done essentially bombarding liquid lithium with um, low uh, amounts of deuterium basically left the, the scientists and engineers quite depressed because it, it showed that the, um, that the temperature at which one could imagine this film surviving was too low to be useful for the fusion reaction. And so then what was done actually was some experiments at much higher fluxes of deuterium. Does that mean I have one minute left? Okay. And so um, and this is showing, uh, whoops, let me go back. Uh, 
this is showing a model, but this is what was actually measured as a function of the amount of deuterium and as a function of the liquid lithium temperature. And what they showed is that, in fact, the, the, that somehow having high amounts of deuterium was leading to a much uh, better survival rate of the liquid lithium film. And they wanted to understand, because they couldn't go in and look, what was it that was maybe leading to that higher survival rate, which is actually quite exciting. So I don't have time to go into the details of this, but we've done these simulations, which actually show that when the deuterium comes in, it actually it forms bonds to the lithium, and you end up making lithium deuteride. And this is more data from the simulations which show that, and that, in fact, it suggests that the deuterium is being sequestered very nicely. And because lithium deuteride has a much higher melting point, it turns out that the, that the liquid film should survive much longer. So I'll just end with um, a last slide, which is to give you a sense that this method called orbital free density functional theory can treat millions of atoms, can treat a smaller number of atoms, but look at much larger um, times, uh, um, time trajectories, which is important. I told you that we have this invention now that allows us to treat up to 10 million atoms. And then I very briefly told you that we have this evidence for de sequestration of the deuterium in the liquid lithium, and that this may help explain some experiments. And it suggests, in, in fact, an invention for how to make the, the fusion reactor work, namely that this so-called thing called a liquid lithium diverter, which is where the, the particles will go in the fusion reactor, should be kept fully deuterated, because then it will be able to operate at the temperatures that one needs. So with that, I'll close and just thank um, the Department of Energy, Fusion Energy Sciences, and the Office of Naval Research, and my um, rep part of my research group that was involved in this uh, for making this work possible. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.